Uh, so hello everybody. Uh, my name is Andre da Silva. Uh, I'm like David said, I'm the new extension vegetable specialist and I'm happy to welcome you guys in our vegetable school 2022. Um, like Dave said, we wish we could be like meeting with you guys uh, in person, but what just happened with the current COVID situation made, us, made it this in a Zoom. However, we are planning some uh, series of variety trials uh, for vegetable crops around the states. Uh, following those variety trials, we're going to have our a few days that we are preparing. Uh, we're going to be scheduled with, with, with each of uh, A and R from uh, A ACs. So you guys are going to be able to come and see our crops in the field. This way you can make questions as you have it on time. If you see a problem that you have in your farm, you can ask us at that time. And uh, if we don't know the answer, we're going to for sure looking for uh, an answer for you and send it in a near future. But today we're going to start talking about tomato crop management and variety selection. Uh, later on, uh, Dr. A will be talking about an IPM for tomatoes. And I want to start about, uh, let you guys know what is currently available in the market for you guys as far as variety. So, and what is the importance of choosing a proper variety? When you go looking for a variety, if you are a home garden or if you have a small acreage, you're going usually in a John Seeds or Seedway or those online, um, those online stores that we have available. If you're a big grower, uh, you usually contact your seeds and you purchase those seeds. But why is important for us to conduct this variety and what do you guys can get from those varieties is because when we as a university, as an extension system, conduct those varieties trials, we are comparing all those seeds available. Usually those companies do variety trials with collaboration with growers or in their research facilities. However, they want to sell their product. We know we want to give you guys the right information that can increase your potential yield. When we select a proper variety, this is the first step of an IPM program. Then we're going to also provide you information with specific markets that you guys are target. By the end, we want to increase your revenue. So that's the main reason why we conduct all those variety trials around the state, because we want to provide our growers the most update information on what can increase their revenue. So keep that in mind when we are talking about variety selection. <clears throat> so this year, what we, we're going to be talking about variety uh, are from four uh, different companies that we have collaborated with those uh, and the varieties that they have been available in the market. Basically what I did is I select the best variety we have seen in the market and we ask it for those companies to share seeds with us. So this way we could compare among them. So we have five varieties from Bijo, Emilu, Resolute. The from Semini, the 7631 Myrtle, the 2310 and the 4676. Ready Bound is a very and well-known variety. And then the Swain, Sunfresh, and Skyward. So that's are the varieties that we compared in the past. And that's the result that we're going to show. I will not be talking about anything on research, but what those varieties can provide you a better yield. So like I said in the beginning, the first step of a cultivar selection is it can provide you an uh, is the first step of an IPM, an integrated pest management. So when you are selecting your varieties, see the disease package. You can enter in their website and find what is the disease package that, that they have. For tomato, in this case, what we have the most problems here is the tomato spotted wilt virus and the tomato, uh, those are more common all around the state, while the tomato yellow leaf curl virus is more located in the south portion of the state. So look for those ones. You also might have some fusarium yield and some other problems. But once you are selecting your variety, look what is the package, the disease packet that that variety has. This way, it's going to help you guys during your IPM program. Following that, we can start talking about their yields. So in this graph, we have the total yield for each of those varieties that I just mentioned that we, are, we were evaluated. And this year is in box or pounds per acre. As you can see, we have the total yield for them. As we go over this talk, we're going to be talking about the size distribution, first harvest. And 
I'm going to vary a little bit on for you to select your market that you want. But the total yield among those varieties were first achieved by Myrtle, Redbound, Emilo, Loretta, 7631, 4566, uh, 4566, Skyway, and, and those are the top varieties for total yield that we find that we found. Well, one particular thing over the, this trial that we noticed is that the variety Myrtle had a high tolerance to bacterial spot. So if you are in an area where you have <clears throat> a bacterial spot as a problem, Myrtle can be one very good. Another one that we found an interesting curiosity is that Emelo and Mountain Gin, they have constant yield across different locations. I have talked with some guys in Florida and some guys in Florida who also conducted variety trials and they found the same consistent uh, yields and vigorous plants across location. So those can also be an option for you. So if you are a grower that is looking for total yield, you don't care about much about quality. So, or you don't care much about like um, certain size of your low, Loretta 7631 and Skyway are the varieties that you are looking for for this coming season. However, if you are a grower that is looking for a particular target market that is your first harvest, we have different response. In this case, our variety Myrtle, those in red in this graph here represent the yield of first harvest. So Myrtle, 7631, 0466, 4576, and the last three, 3275, 2310, Resolute and Sunfresh, are the varieties that you are looking for. So let's say that you are a grower planting in early spring, you're gonna be competing against some guys in South Florida that they are also supporting the market. If you are a large grower, then you wanna first harvest to be a high, the, the top of your harvest. Those varieties in red here, those grab bar in red or here in red represent the variety that you should pick. It was followed by the first harvest by the ones in gray. And then the last one was Skyway, our variety who yield the most in the end of the season. So this is the kind of strategy that you must to have when you are planting, uh, selecting your cultivar disease. And when are you harvesting that? Are you competing against like your neighbor? Are you competing against other states market? So pay attention on what you want. I like also to see how was the fruit size. What is the size distribution you're getting? Do you want to like a very big breakfast tomato or you want to like smaller tomatoes so you can like pack it more or you can have sell it in a fresh market? So I also made a distribution of the size of our tomato. So here we are again with our total yield, but now in proportions of X large, large, and medium tomatoes. So this way, you know what you are looking for. And as you can see, the variety Myrtle, which was our top variety, was very similar to our Sunfresh, which was our variety that had the lowest total yield, but was sim similar for X large. So they both can be selected for our X large. So let's say if you sell your produce, your tomatoes in a fresh market, what do you go you gonna do? See, when you want to harvest it, select a variety that's going to harvest early or late, and then see what is the size you are looking. If we're looking more for a, uh, selling it on uh, for a, a restaurant that they usually go, so you're going to check on our reports, which is the variety that per performed the better. And the same thing for medium tomatoes. Medium tomatoes are usually preferred for uh, processing um for the processing industry. So you can usually select a variety who produce a better medium tomato. So keep that in mind when you are selecting. So like I said, Myrtle was very good yield, total yield, but that yield was not different for X large tomato as Sunfresh, which was our lowest. On the other hand, Sunfresh was better than Emlo, who total yield was larger. So those are the kind of information I would like to, for you guys to keep in mind when selecting a tomato variety. <clears throat> and use this information. All that we I mentioned here will be in a report in the ACES website on the commercial horticulture routine. So you guys are gonna have this available for you. 
Uh, one particular thing that I would like to talk with you guys, still on the tomato cultivar selection, is that I got some information with people from Florida. From a, so it's a different variety trial than the one that I mentioned. This was conducted in Florida. It's about the bacterial response severity. That is a main disease that we're gonna have in the state. And they did a trial there where they evaluated what is the impact of bacterial spot on the vigor of the plant. So they gave you score from zero to a hundred for the bacterial spot and from zero to 10 for the vigor of the plant. As you can see here, the variety uh, Myrtle, Resolute, Mountain Gem and Emlo that were in our variety trial, they have different performance on the bacterial spot. Myrtle showed a good resistance to bacterial spot, while Emlo had a higher score for the, for the bacterial spot. However, Emlo, even with a higher score on bacterial spot uh, rating, it had a higher vigor, 8.7 when compared to 7.7 .7 of Myrtle. So it shows that it also has some tolerance to the bacterial spot. So plants is still health and still can produce. So this is another thing that I'm gonna make it available for you. I, you guys and you need to keep in mind so mountain gen mountain gen and myrtle are some of the varieties that we are recommending as as um ex, as an extension specialist i would recommend for our uh growers because they have seen constanting yield constanting resistance to bacterial spot over the years that we have been investigating variety trials even if they have got some bacterial spot it doesn't say that they are resistant they are tolerant but they have been with a good a good vigor and they can pr uh, probably uh, help you guys to achieve your potential yield. So switching a little bit gears from cultivar, now that you guys have all these information, you guys are gonna be able to select what is the cultivar you guys, you can select, uh, you wanna select for your, uh, for this year's season. I just wanna talk a little bit about planting dates. Planting date is another factor that's going to be important for you guys when, when uh, determined um, when doing a tomato production. You want select planting dates where temperatures are fine and high. So during the spring, you can grow in North Alabama between April 15. You should be planting between eight, April 15 and June 15. On the other hand, in South Alabama, you need to anticipate your planting date. March 1st to April 30 is the ideal uh, ideal planting days. <clears throat> in, during the fall, you can also plant tomato. Most of people uh, that we have been talking, they just grow it during the summer when it's hot. So remember, you don't want to have a very high temperatures. That's going to just stress your plant. You want to maintain it between 55 and 85 Fahrenheit. So why not optimize your year? have two growing seasons. So you can grow it during the spring and now during the fall. So in the fall, if you wanna plant tomato, North Alabama, I would recommend from July 1st to August uh, 1. On South Alabama, July 15 to August 15. You don't wanna delay much your planting date because you're gonna get colder conditions and that's gonna abort your, uh, your, your fruits. So those are optimums. But also I will remember avoid planting uh, your planting date when you're flowering and your fruiting will be during the summer because you're going to have problems with sun scouting. If you plant it too late during the spring or too early during the fall and you get high temperatures, you're going to have problems with sun scouting, which is a disorder causer that is a consequence of a low biomass accumulation. So you don't, you will not have a good foliage, your fruits will be exposure, and then you're gonna have sunny scout. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later. Once you determine your planting date in spring or fall, if you're in the north portion or in the south portion of the state, we can start talking about fertilizer. Fertilizer is the second, is the third step. So cultivar selection, determine your planting date. Now, how are you gonna feed your plants? And that's our fertilizer. So the first step of a proper fertilization is you should conduct a soil sample. Do a soil sample in your area. It's not costly and it will give you an overview of what's going on in your area. Once you conduct your soil sample, it will tell you how much fertilizer to apply. And usually it varies in three main nutrients, nitrogen, phosphor, and potash, NPK. Nitrogen for tomato usually varies from 130 to 210 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Usually nitrogen is the most mobile nutrient in the soil that 
easily leach. So most of the times you're gonna be applying about a 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Phosphor is less mobile than it, but it's still, you need some phosphorus being applied. So it's gonna range about 100, 200 pounds of P2O5 per acre. And potash is a good nutrient that is required most in the beginning and in the end of the season. About 240 pounds of K2O per acre. But how to do that application? That application should not be in a single application early in the season. It should be spread along of the growing season. So first, you're gonna apply about 20 to 30% of your uh, fertilizer at pre-planting when you are preparing your bed. So you are just giving a good nutrient for the plants early in the season to induce root development. Most of your phosphorus will be applied early in the season. Phosphorus is the nutrient that induces root growth. So you, your uh, plants will be health early in the season. Nitrogen is still needed. Potash is still needed, but not as high as phosphorus. So most of your phosphorus is applied early in the season, while nitrogen and potash are applied more later in the season. The other 8 to 20% of your fertilizer should be applied during weekly application if you have the ability to do liquid fertilizer, usually drip tape, or, or when you have a drip tape system for irrigation, or you can do two or three more applications of a granular fertilizers. Some examples of most common fertilizers are 10-10-10, 5-10-15, and the 3400 for a granular fertilizer. So you're going to apply most of your phosphor, like I said, early in the season. So you can do 10-10-10 for 20% or 30% or 3400 later in the season. If you have a liquid fertilizer, I strong uh, the ability to apply liquid fertilizer, I strongly recommend you to do weekly applications of about 10 to 15 pounds of, ni of nitrogen per acre. You're gonna always be basing your fertilizer on your nitrogen and you can apply like 707, 408 or 909 with 11% of calcium. Those are the most uh, common fertilizer for tomato productions. And actually they have been shown the best success for achieve higher yields on tomato production. And I'm gonna give you guys some example why you should apply those uh, fertilizer and properly apply uh, fertilizer and in particular liquid fertilizer. Because we conduct a study on blossom end rot, which is uh, caused by an insufficient calcium in the tissue. It's induced by growth, a faster growth rate high humidity, irrigation stress, excess of ammonium, which is a nitrogen, so, uh, nitrogen fertilizer, excess of potassium as well, and lack of calcium. So if you do a proper fertilization, you can minimize this problem because caused by the ratio of calcium and nitrogen. If you have too much nitrogen and low calcium in your soil, your plants will be focused on the nitrogen, will lack calcium, and will cause the blossom end rot which is this rotting part in the blossom end of your fruit, commonly seen in tomatoes and bell peppers, which are solanaceous crops. So we did a trial where we uh, investigate two fertilizer strategies, 707 and 408 rotated with CN9. Those are liquid fertilizers. They were applied in different rates, 107, 200, and even 225 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Remember, the the recommendation is up to 210, but it doesn't mean that you cannot apply more if you have uh, rainfall leading leaching. So we evaluate two different total nitrogen applied, and we applied weekly 15, 17.5, on this case, almost 18 and 20 pounds of nitrogen per acre per week. So those are the rates that of liquid fertilizer that we use in 707, 408, with, and rotate 408 with CN9 weekly. So one weekly 408, another weekly CN9. One week for weight, another week CN9, and then 707 every week. Our results, this was conducted in 2016 and 2017, and this is the percentage of blossom and rot that we got from our nitrogen rates, our level of nitrogen, 175, 225 pounds. The black bar here represents our strategy of rotating 408, NPK with CN9, which is the calcium nitrate, 900. The red one, rep one represents our 707. 
in a dry year and in a regular year. As you can see, in a dry year, when we don't have rainfall events, we're going to have problems with blossom and rot more than in 2017, when we have a wet year, more regular rainfall events. It was even distribution, it's even distributed. Why? Because rainfall induced nitrogen leaching. When it's induced nitrogen leach, you evenly the nitrogen content in the soil with the calcium. But when you don't have that, that rainfall leaching nitrogen, you apply too much nitrogen, as higher is your nitrogen rate, the higher will be the incidence of blossom and rot. So keep that in mind. You don't want to increase too much your nitrogen because you might going to have those problems with blossom and rot. We have seen growers saying, oh, I apply 250, 300 pounds of nitrogen. So this way, if I have a problem, uh, I have enough nutrients for the plant. And what's happening is they are spending money with excess of nutrients, uh, of fertilizer, and they're inducing lower quality yield because you're going to have problems with blossom and rot. So keep that in mind. So here, as you can see, uh, in the dry year, as we increase the nitrogen rates, we increase the incidence of blossom and rot. But the same was not seen with the 707. Why? Because they were always having blossom and rot. Weight rotating weekly with CNI, which is the calcium nitrate, 9% nitrogen, zero phosphorus, zero potash, and 11% of calcium was better or reduced the blossom and rot when compared to 707. Actually, in a dry year, our calcium content in the plant tissue was 1.2, while in our calcium content in the plant tissue in a regular wet year was 2.1. So you can see that the calcium increase the the lower calcium in the plant tissue increased the blossom and rot, while it was not in 2017 when we had a higher calcium uh, content in the plant tissue. Another fact that we saw is that the 707 in, in 2016 had no impact in the blossom and rot, but this 408 rotate with calcium nitrate reduced block and rot. This was not seen in the, in the wet year. And finally, Lower nitrogen rates, which I just said, they also reduce the instance of uh, blossom rain rot when the strategy of rotating was used for fertilizer management. So keep that in mind that those uh, strategies, oops, I'm sorry, sure can help you guys to reduce those problems caused by um, incorrect fertilization. Uh, and it's an option for you guys. For you guys, 408, 707, and calcium nitrate are the most common fertilizer, and they are currently available for you guys. Switching gears from fertilizer to irrigation, I should say that they are linked in a way that won't affect the other. Remember, I'm saying that nitrogen is the most mobile nutrient in the soil. So if you irrigate too much, you're going to move nitrogen to deeper levels of the soil and you're going to have a problem with nitrogen. So keep in mind that an irrigation man management is very important for your tomato yard or for your tomato field. Uh, <clears throat> actually, if you, I put this sentence here because I know that some of our growers do not irrigate it, but I was like just doing quick, a quick research on what's happened if you don't irrigate, because usually we just have irrigated tomato. If you don't irrigate it, your yields can be reduced by 60%. Irrigation is essential to produce consistent yields of high quality tomatoes. You can increase your yields by 60%. So if you have put a tomato in the field and don't irrigate, don't expect you have high yields. You can, do, you can have two systems, drip irrigation or sprinkler irrigation. I strongly recommend if you have to install one, do a drip irrigation. Drip irrigation is much more accurate. You're going to be applying water for your root system while and you get in, you're just going to induce uh, more disease. As you wet your leaves, you create vulnerable conditions for those leaves to accept disease to get into the plant system. So you're going to have problems. So I strongly recommend drip. However, you have the option for sprinkling. And what you need to do is properly manage your water application. What I mean is your irrigation scheduling. I put the systematic irrigation scheduling type here, which is the application of the same volume of water every day. But I'm not a big fan of that. 
because you are not accounting sometimes for your rainfall events or you are just applying water as you think it's the best one. However, this is what most of growers do. And what I would recommend is in the early stage of the crop development, like after transplanting, you should apply about 0.5 inch or a half an inch of water per day. However, when you have fruiting or you are at maturation, you should be already applying about 1.5 inch per day. And this is how much water the plants should be receiving and not how much is the efficiency of your system, okay? Another better strategy that I should mention here is that you can irrigate based on your crop water demand and your soil moisture sensors. Uh, I will not get in depth on this particular topic because uh, we have a whole training on how to properly uh, schedule irrigation events, but those are you guys. So if you have any question in the future, just let me know and we can go in, in depth on uh, how to use the crop water demand and soil moisture sensors for tomato production. What I would like to show you here is that under irrigation, your, your volume of water would vary from a half an inch to an inch and a half per day. Finally, what I would like to show is if you don't, if you start to see some symptoms like this, those ones that are most common on tomatoes, our tomatoes disorder, this is usually related by planting date, fertilization, or uh, water demand. So blossom and rot, we have already talked that it's a calcium deficient in your plant tissue, and it's a rotting in the blossom end of your fruit. Uh, another problem that is very common is sun discount. We also talk about that. When you select a proper planting date and you do a good fertility management, you're going to have a good coverage of your plant and, uh, and your, uh, uh, your good canopy closure, and then your fruit will not be exposed for the sun. However, if the fruit is exposed to the sun, you're going to see this whiting part uh, in the stem end of your fruit. So that's a very common problem. And here, one thing that it's also shown in this photo is these straight lines on our tomato here. It's because this is caused by excess. Caused a exposure, uh, lower biomass accumulation and an exposure of the fruit to the sun. Fruit cracking is something that most of our growers see and it's a very common. This is usually caused by a rapid growth of our fruits at rainfall events. What's happened is we have rainfall events. Our roots are uptaking water, but there is no nutrient available for them. So they will just uptake water without nutrients. In this way, they're going to expand their tissue and it's going to crack because there is no nutrient to fill the cells of your fruit when it's needed. So fruit cracking, cracking when you see those cracking here, it's because of rainfall events. There is nothing we can do. It's something related to the weather. And unfortunately, it's some problem that we, we can, as extension specialists, we cannot like, or as a farmer, as a consultant, we cannot like treat it. It's gonna happen if you have a very uh, frequent uh, rainfall events. Another problem I didn't put a photo here is the blossom drop. When you see your uh, tomatoes flowers dropping down, it's probably because of high temperature. So like I said, selecting a proper planting date, it's ideal so you can avoid, avoid the abortion of your, uh, your flowers. And late it, but not, um, not uh, un if you grow tomato for a while, you probably have seen those white tissue inside your fruits. I think that this picture is not represented pretty well, but those who had that problem have seen, you usually have a hollow tomato with a white tissue there, and that's caused by pota potassium deficiency. So potassium is high, it's more recommended than nitrogen, but nitrogen will impact your fruit yield while potassium will impact the quality of your fruit. That's why we recommend from 200 to 400 pounds of nitrogen um for tomato but it's still do a soil sample analysis um and uh those are the most in common problems that we probably will be seeing uh in this coming in this coming season you you have seen that weather variability is a problem we have been having like warmer ears cold ears and uh 
and the exposure to sun, the rainfall events will be impact your production. So selecting your cultivar, conducting a proper uh, planting date, selecting a good strategy for fertilization, and properly irrigate your crop will definitely minimize those common disorders that we have for tomatoes, will increase your yield, will save in fertilizer, and will finally increase your profits. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk. And if you have any, uh, as part of the commercial horticultural team, our vegetable crop program is here to help you guys.